take me forward 20 years. In a dream scenario, how does the region look? In a dream scenario, economic development, which I think is what the Abraham Accords were about and what the burgeoning Saudi peace deal was about. And by the way, the burgeoning Saudi peace deal is the reason that Hamas did this at the behest of Iran. They were afraid of a regional realignment that would create a Sunni Jewish alliance right. oriented largely against the, the, the Shia power of Iran, which is spread through Lebanon and Syria and now down into, into Hamasistan. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the economic development is the only way to move forward for the region. That was the premise of the Abraham Accords. Again, it was the premise of the, the nascent Saudi peace deal. Israel would love to do that with the Palestinian Authority. They would love to do that with, with anyone governing the Palestinians to provide better economic conditions. I mean, one of the great ironies of all this is that 20% of Israel's population is Arab. The, the Arabs in Israel earn a far better income. They, they have far better GDP per capita than Arabs who are living under the Palestinian Authority or under the Gaza or under, the, or under Hamas. And when you take polls of Israeli Arabs, many of whom are not particularly fond of the state of Israel, almost zero of them wish to actually relocate to any of these areas because economic development is economic development. The, the way out of this is that, but in order for that to happen, the people on the other side of the table have to actually agree that economic development is a worthwhile thing, is an end goal. And this goes back to the original point that I was making, is that we in the West, we believe that economic development worthwhile. That what we are all seeking is the same sort of peaceful, decent life where we leave each other alone and get to live our lives. I think that we all we all agree on that. But there's a group of people who absolutely do not agree with that, and they don't care about the level of economic development. They would rather live. I mean, Hamas would rather that its own citizens live in poverty and penury and orient themselves against the extermination of the Jews than that economic development even be allowed to take place. I mean, do you, do you I, I believe, know everyone do you believe in the Israeli government, I, I promise you, Everyone in the Israeli government, right to left, would love nothing better than economic development of the people surrounding them so they don't have to send their sons and daughters to go fight and die in Gaza. Do you believe in the concept of a two-state solution? I mean, if there were a party on the other side to negotiate with and if, there, if, the, if the possibility of a two-state solution was real, sure. I mean, but the question is, how realistic is that? Negotiations cannot be the 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 cure all you can't you, you have to have a partner on the other side of the table the entire premise of the oslo accord is that you could take an actual terrorist by the name of yasser arafat you could you could negotiate with him you could make a deal with him and this would magically cure the situation well a deal is not capable of being cut with with literally anyone that's not the way any of this works so in order for there to be any sort of long-term peace including a palestinian state there would have to be a complete difference in in leadership in, in these areas, and that would actually require Palestinian moderates to take the floor. The Palestinian Authority is not a, is not a moderate group. Islamic Jihad is a terrorist group. Hamas is a terrorist group. And until that changes, nothing's going to change. And by the way, there is the possibility of that change. If you had told me 10 years ago that there would be Saudi-Israeli normalization on the table, mm. I would have laughed in your face. If you had told me that Israel would have been able to cut peace deals with the UAE and with Morocco, I, I, would, have, I would have scoffed. And yeah. I think everyone would have scoffed. So there is that possibility. But again, I would also, you cannot make peace with a side that wants to murder you. That is not a possibility. Well, on that point, all I would say to that is I'm an Irish Catholic and we had the troubles in Northern Ireland. And in the end, a peace deal was achieved, but it was achieved by people sitting down opposite people they knew had been killing civilians and killing people on their side. You even had the Queen meeting Martin McGuinness and Gerry Adams, who were the... Uh, you know, in McGuinness's case, the former chief of staff of the IRA, he ordered some of the most appalling atrocities. I was actually at Number 10 Downing Street when Tony Blair met McGuinness and Adams on the steps for the first time in, in 70 years uh, as the members of Sinn Féin and shook their hands. I was next in to see him in his office and it was a, an extraordinary moment to watch. And it was a moment many people thought would never happen. Um, do you see any parallel there in terms of what could be achieved with Israel and Palestine? Only if the leadership changes. Only if the leadership changes on the Palestinian side. That is the only way that happens. And again, the, uh, the, the difference here is that the IRA had territorial ambitions. Hamas does not have territorial ambitions. They have genocidal ambitions. The Palestinian Authority has been offered multiple deals over multiple decades, and they have rejected, without counter offers, virtually every deal they have ever been offered. Islamic Jihad is a terrorist group. Again, if, if the IRA was dedicated to the complete slaughter and eradication of every non-Irish Britisher in the UK, mm. that would be the equivalent of Hamas. And that would not be a negotiating position because, again, could there be successful negotiations? It depends on, it depends on the partner. Right. I mean, the, the, the example that you're using is, is the best example of sides that are incredibly far apart coming together. But here we are talking about one side that, simple premise, if Israel put down all of its guns tomorrow, every Jew in the region would be slaughtered. If Hamas put down all of its guns tomorrow, Israel would leave the Gaza Strip alone. It is that simple.
Let me ask you, you got into a, a, a Twitter spat with Andrew Tate yesterday. He's a converted Muslim. He'd been doing a lot of uh, supportive tweets uh, for the Palestinians. And he tweeted at you at one stage, Mr Tough Guy, let me assure you, as someone who's done his own fighting, as opposed to excitedly encouraging others to do it for him while sitting at home on a comfy chair, peace is always worth a conversation. What, what was that spat about? Why did you engage with him? What do you feel about that? Uh, well, what I feel about that is that he was tweeting that immediately, like as terrorists were still running around in southern Israel. That was on October 10th. And he was still tweeting while the bodies were fresh and warm in the streets. We're not going to be lectured on morality and toughness by, by Andrew Tate, whose great idea of toughness and morality is pimping women and then bragging about it on air and, and trying to quasi-walk it back while simultaneously maintaining many of the same positions and flexing his biceps. I mean, he's got a huge following, as you know, especially online. Uh, is, it, is it dangerous? Is it reckless that he's able to tweet from house arrest still? of course, in Romania, that he can tweet on something like this and have the kind of influence that he has? Listen, everyone should be able to tweet whatever it is that they want. I'm all for an open discourse, even with people who I think are dead wrong on a lot of these issues. But Andrew Tate is dead wrong on a lot of these issues. And, and the, the particularly ridiculous posturing about being a... a, a yes, you're very, yes, you're very tough when you, when you want people to make peace with, with terrorists who just murder their children. Very, very tough. You mentioned Iran earlier. Uh, President Biden yesterday came out, 10-minute speech, you know, sounded very tough and very supportive of Israel, but never once mentioned Iran. Was that a, a failure by him, or are they waiting to establish concrete evidence of Iran's involvement? So I think there's a good reason he could have done that and a bad reason that he could have done that. And the, the bad reason is pretty obvious, which is that the United States has unfrozen $6 billion in assets to, to flood into Iran in return for hostages. That money is fungible, and there's every possibility that money flowing into Iran since, since the weakening of sanctions has contributed to Iran's spread of terror. That is not only a possibility, that's a probability, and everyone knows it. So if you avoid mentioning Iran, then presumably it avoids blowback. That is the bad reason. The good reason might be that the United States wants to take down the temperature in the region. So right now, geopolitically, this is a contained conflict. This is Israel versus Hamas in the Gaza Strip, and everyone of good heart on every side should hope that it remains that way. If Hezbollah, which is on Israel's northern border and is an Iranian client, uh, Hezbollah is a massive and significantly more powerful than Hamas terrorist group that exists and, and has say in the government of Lebanon. Again, Israel is surrounded on a lot of sides by terrorist groups that masquerade as government. Uh, Hezbollah has about 150,000 much more sophisticated rockets than, than Hamas pointed at northern Israel. Everyone understands that if Hezbollah, which would only do this at the behest of Iran, if, if Hezbollah were to get in, Israel would then be stretched militarily to the point where they would not have any choice but to go full force. And what that means is that all of the talk right now about the, the supposed disproportionate force that Israel is using in the Gaza Strip talk with which I wildly disagree, uh, that, that will all go out the window because once you are stretched to the point of extermination, all bets are off. And, and the Israeli Air Force will have to be unleashed on the, on the southern border of Lebanon. At that point, you'd have to imagine that, that Bashar Assad in Syria starts to get active, Iran starts to get active. So one of the things that, that the, the possible good reason why he didn't mention Iran is because he's attempting to keep Iran out of the war. That basically the idea would be, he did say in the speech that any other group that wants to get in, don't. America, to its great credit, to our great credit, we've stationed a, a battle carrier, an aircraft carrier outside of uh, outside of Lebanon in, in the Mediterranean, and basically said to Hezbollah that they should not get in. Uh, that is, in fact, the, the best available move. So again, there's a very plausible bad reason why he didn't mention Iran, which is to avoid the blowback from his own idiotic Iran policy. And there's a possible good reason, which is that he's attempting to avoid the broadening of the conflict. Donald Trump says, as he's wont to do with these crises, that it would never have happened if he was president, uh, do you think that may have some truth? I think there's some truth to that, for sure. I, I think that, that, that Iran has seen weakness. Iran saw an opportunity to, to prevent the Saudis from coming into to the Abraham Accords, and uh, they thought that they could push where they saw mush. I mean, the withdrawal from Afghanistan made America look weak. The continuous dealings between the United States and Iran, despite Iran's openly genocidal intentions with regard to Israel, uh, has made America look weak. The fact that Robert Malley, who is one of the chief negotiators for the United States, was apparently co-opted by Iranian intelligence groups makes the Americans look, look particularly weak. And so appearances of weakness in the Middle East matter an awful lot. It is, it is not politics in Western states you know, where, where we try to negotiate, we try to have discussions. That is not how politics works in the Middle East. It is a place where strength is, is really the only point of the realm.